child has been lost, not kidnapped by terrorists and concealed in a cave to weep and starve and rouse an entire nation to frantic searching. Were that the case, a thousand men and women would instantly rise to the rescue. Unfortunately, the loss of the child, though tragic and very real, has been without any cry of alarm. The fact is, his father lost him. Too busy to spend time with him, to work and play with him, to answer his trivial questions. The child's hand slips out of his own, and now the child is lost. In fact, his mother also lost him. Caught up in her social events, she lets the sitter entertain the child with the latest TV show. Suddenly, she is startled to find that the child is lost. It seems that she has but briefly glanced away. Indeed, the church lost him. Preoccupied with sermons and programs for the wise and wealthy, the church overlooked the child in the pew. It gave him no real part in the church service. It organized no meaningful activities for the youth. It established no school where he could learn in the presence of God. Now the church and many heavy-hearted parents are searching earnestly for the lost child. Abruptly, we find ourselves before the judgment throne. A divine question rings forth. Where is the flock that was given to you, your beautiful sheep? As individuals, as families, as a church, we have a divine commission regarding our young people. Scripture prompts us, train up a child in the way he should go. It reminds us, teach the words of God diligently to your children. It is not enough to be informed. We must be transformed. It is not enough to explore the sciences we must delve into the science of salvation. It is not enough to be equipped merely for this life. We must be prepared for a life that begins now and extends through eternity. As a people, we have been summoned out of Babylon. We have been called to separate ourselves from the evils of secular society and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. As God's chosen people, we must not let the world squeeze us into its mold. The current of the world is raging away from God. We cannot afford to allow our children to be swept away and lost in the turbulence of its assumptions and agendas. The hearts of the young are easily impressed by good or by evil. As Paul pointed out, it is by beholding that we become changed. We bring our children to Sabbath school and church so that they will learn the truth. Why then would we send them to a school where they learn something quite different? Why would we enroll them in courses that invert values and that delete God from the equation? 
as they sit at the feet of instructors that belittle scripture and ridicule faith. If we place our children before agnostic teachers, if we immerse them in evolution, atheism, and secular humanism, should we be surprised if they become infidels and skeptics? When they spend more time in the world than in the church, they slowly but surely begin to lean toward the world. And leaning toward the world, they suddenly fall for the world. We place our children in the hands of the secular world. See them on the playground. It seems innocent enough. See them in amusement, in marriage, in business. Their hands grasped in the hand of the world. See them finally dying in the arms of the world. Educated worldlings. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? We thought that they were on the path to heaven, but they have been blindfolded and abducted by the world. The great danger in secular schools is their shrewdly mixing good and evil. Notice the difference between the two basic educational systems, God's plan and its counterfeit. Secular education is man-centered. Christian education is God-centered. Secular education is world-focused. Christian education is word-focused. Secular education is informative. It emphasizes knowing. Christian education is formative. It holds that while knowledge is important, there is something more vital and that is character. Secular education maintains that Jesus is a historical figure, perhaps even a great man. Christian education affirms that Jesus is Lord. Secular education is rampant with subtle but deadly assumptions. It holds that humans are supreme. If this were true, then there would be no higher power. It maintains that people evolved from lower forms of life. If this were true, then there was no act of divine creation. Secular education asserts that a bad environment is to blame for evil behavior. If this were true, human beings would not be responsible for their actions. Secular education contends that common practice sets the standard. This, of course, assumes that whatever the majority is doing must be right. And if this is true, then there are no moral absolutes. Secular education claims that the term maladjustment explains adverse human behavior. Therefore, there is no such thing as guilt. Finally, secular education holds that men and women are inherently good. And if this were true, then he has no need of a Savior. When you think of it, how foolish to attempt to be wise apart from wisdom, to be true while rejecting truth, to be enlightened apart from light, 
to be nourished without food, to exist without life, to be educated without God. What makes Adventist education unique? Seventh-day Adventist education is a life-transforming experience, a spiritual revolution. It is not simply something to be pursued and framed and hung. Its height is service. Its depth is commitment. Its scope is eternity. The Word of God must be the foundation of all we do in the school, not just of the Bible class, but of every subject, every topic. Ellen White writes, Establish church schools. Give your children the Word of God as the foundation of all their education. She then adds, in localities where there is a church, schools should be established even if there are no more than six children to attend. The essential pillars of learning are to know God, to understand His plan for our life, and to exemplify Him in all we do. The resulting structure is an education with a view of eternity. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This education provides a safe shelter for our children. It furnishes them with a sense of purpose, of identity, of belonging. When your children are taught by God, Isaiah affirms, great shall be the peace of your children. Luke 252 describes the education that God provided for His own Son. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. Notice that Jesus developed in four key areas, mental, physical, spiritual, and social. This balanced, whole person development is what our children and youth must experience. First, wisdom. Many schools impart knowledge, but wisdom is our greater need. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to leverage knowledge, to apply it in tangible and constructive ways. Such enhanced knowledge cast into the crucible of life seeks to reveal God's attributes and make a difference in the lives of others. This calls for students to be connected to the source of wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. It calls for high-level thinking, analysis, decision-making, and creativity. It is the work of true education to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. Wisdom, furthermore, requires excellence. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with 
your might. Those satisfied with second-rate performance simply cannot do God's work. At the end of the day, they will stumble up to the wrong destination, dragging a chain of failures. Second, stature. True education must be useful. We cannot afford to be top-heavy, filled with grand ideas that are never carried out. Consequently, Adventist education emphasizes practical skills and the development of a solid work ethic. The importance of this dimension is highlighted by the fact that Jesus spent the first three decades of his life in the carpenter's shop, learning and perfecting a practical skill. In this physical domain, Adventist education also emphasizes fitness and a healthy lifestyle. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? As God's representatives, we must present an appealing picture of God, one that is best conveyed by a healthy, vibrant life. Third, favor with God. In the spiritual arena, students in Adventist schools study God's Word. They learn how to pray, how to have faith. They fellowship with other young people who share their spiritual goals and commitments. They participate in worship activities, Bible classes, and times of spiritual emphasis. They encounter Seventh-day Adventist teachers as mentors and role models. They experience the Holy Spirit in their lives, and in so doing, they develop a biblical worldview. In Adventist education, faith and learning meet and merge. Fragments of knowledge are drawn into a robust spiritual unity centered on God, the source of all truth. Faith penetrates and infuses learning like water permeates a sponge. After all, Christianity is a lifestyle, not just an add-on. We do not need Christianity flowing alongside of life. We need Christian lives. We do not need individuals who can serve on occasion as Christians. We need genuine Christians, 24-7. And fourth, favor with men. Let us suppose that we are preparing surgeons. On graduation day, our candidate marches down the aisle and is handed the parchment, declaring them a surgeon. The next day, they find themselves in the surgery suite. And there, on the operating table, is the victim, sorry, the patient. Our freshly minted graduate breaks out in a cold sweat. Their knees start to buckle. In all their training, they have never before stepped into an operating room. Preposterous, you declare. A travesty, malpractice. You are absolutely right. But don't we do the same thing? We cannot expect our young people to graduate from school 
to move out into society and to be effective witnesses for God when they have never had any training or significant experience in witness or service. In Adventist schools, students learn how to touch the lives of others. They learn of Christ who did not come to be served, but to serve. They discover that to live is to give. They find that they have a calling, a mission to fulfill, and a message to share. Ellen White summarized it this way. True education means more than the pursual of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the wider joy of service in the world to come. Does Adventist education make a difference? Is it effective? To answer those questions, the Cognitive Genesis Study looked at factors that contributed to the success of students in Adventist education. More than 800 schools participated with 52,000 students in grades 3 through 9 and in grade 11. Results from the study indicated that students in Seventh-day Adventist schools surpassed the national average on standardized tests in all subject areas, for all grade levels, and for all school sizes. And furthermore, regardless of ability level. There was something else. As the number of years in an Adventist school increased, the difference between those who attended Adventist schools and the national average became more pronounced, both in terms of achievement as well as ability. Clearly, the academic result is impressive. However, this is not the most important result. Scripture reminds us, what will you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Writing to church leaders and educators, Ellen White declared that the all-important matter is the conversion of the student. What is the role of Adventist education in terms of young people joining the church and remaining in the church? One study, for example, compared attendance at Adventist schools with the baptismal rate of children from Adventist families that involved 844 participants. It studied those who received no Adventist education, those who received one or more years of Adventist education, and those who received 11 or more years of Seventh-day Adventist education. It then compared the proportion of those who had been baptized and those who had never been baptized. For those with no Adventist education, close to 60% had joined the church. Approximately 85% 
of those with one or more years of Adventist education joined, while in the group with 11 or more years Adventist education, over 96% joined the church. Consider the other side of the equation. If we compare those with 11 or more years of Adventist education with those who had no Adventist education, the children from Adventist families were 13 times more likely to have never joined the church when they received no Adventist education. There is a second matter, however, the matter of retention. Over the past three decades, there have been at least seven studies that have examined the role of Adventist education in retention. One of these, the Value Genesis study in 2010, examined factors related to the development of religious faith in more than 2,200 12th grade students. Of these, the most important factor that nurtured their faith was attending a Seventh-day Adventist school. In fact, 81% of all students indicated that attending an Adventist school is the most important thing that has helped me develop my religious faith. Another study compared Adventist youth from families who had graduated from public high schools and those who graduated from Adventist academies. The researcher followed these young people for a 13-year period. He then examined whether these individuals, 13 years later, had been baptized and were still attending, were a member but no longer attending, were no longer a member, or had never been baptized. For those young people, from Seventh-day Adventist families who had graduated from a public high school. 37% had been baptized and were still attending 13 years later, while 7% were a member but no longer attending. Tragically, 38% had been baptized but were no longer a member and 18% had never been baptized. For those who had graduated from a Seventh-day Adventist Academy, however, 77% had been baptized and were attending 13 years after graduation. 5% were a member and no longer attending, 13% were no longer a member, and 6% had never been baptized. In essence, young people were twice as likely to stay in the Seventh-day Adventist church 13 years later if they had graduated from a Seventh-day Adventist academy. Or, to group the data another way, 63% of young people from Adventist families who had graduated from a public high school were no longer involved with the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church 13 years later, compared with 23% of young people who had graduated from a Seventh-day Adventist Academy. The study also examined the matter of those who married a Seventh-day Adventist. For those from Adventist families who had graduated from a public high school, only 27% married a Seventh-day Adventist, whereas 78% of the graduates from Adventist academies married a Seventh-day Adventist. Three times 
more likely to marry an Adventist if they had graduated from an Adventist academy. All together, perhaps, this is why Ellen White wrote, The Work of Education and the Work of Redemption are one. As you can see, Seventh-day Adventist schools not only make a difference, they are intentionally different, distinctive by design. They are Christ-centered and Bible-based. They are student-connected and socially applied. They are places where faith and learning unite where students study the sciences and at the same time link their learning to the Creator. They are places where young people are taught not only about God, but by God. They are places where our young people learn to recognize the voice of the teacher sent from God. It is not sufficient to merely prepare for a job, a profession, or a career. We must be prepared for heaven. We must give our young people an education that is consistent with our faith, that will form character to endure the test of time. Worldly influences like waves of the sea beat against young people and threaten to sweep them away. Where are your children? Have you placed their feet firmly on the rock that will not move? We must make no compromise. God calls us out of Babylon. We are to live for Christ, not for the world. We are called to convert the world, not be converted by the world, subverted and diverted from our mission. We cannot allow our children to become bewitched by a false education. Our children are too precious to be abducted and lost for eternity. As parents, we must invest where it matters most in our children even if it requires personal sacrifice. As a church family, we must rally together and find creative means to ensure that each of the children and youth in our congregations have the opportunity of a Seventh-day Adventist education. Adventist education is distinctive. There is nothing that can take its place. Don't permit a pretense to displace reality, a bogus education to replace the true. Value the divine plan above the counterfeit. Will your children be taught of God? Will they be educated for eternity? The choice today shapes tomorrow. <laughs>